he's taught me quite a few things, really. Um, so we're going to just talk about sort of errors in this in Java Scala kind of world. So um, in the beginning, you know, I, I did Java for for ten or ten or more years, uh, and in in this world of Java. Um, exceptions are a very big part of you know everyday life, um, and no no more than the null pointer exception, which we see almost every day, if we're not careful. And with a null pointer, it's not going to tell you very much. You know, the null pointer itself doesn't tell you anything at all, and we need this stack trace to now tell us something useful. So in this case, the stack trace tells us that it was on you know it was thrown from line 23 from one file and from that line 11 of another file. And so without that stack trace, those null pointers are pretty much deadly because there's no way to figure out what actually went wrong. So I actually had this up at a, a previous job before. Um, you know, someone would say, like, I've got a null pointer exception, and we would like, well, okay, we need a bit more information than that. So the stack traces are vital in those kinds of things. So that throwing that exception, in, you know, is you know doesn't give you enough information. Sorry, Charles. Oh, sure. Is that better? Sorry. Cool. Okay. Okay, and this is just a cheap job. It's not really to do with the talk, but you know, actually, you know, we're all using Spring and Hibernate, so of course the stack traces look look a bit more like this. Um, in fact, this is only a small one, really, uh, and the bits that we care about are the bit up there and the bit in there, and the rest is all proxying stuff. Um, but, but as a side note, that's probably a bit more interesting is that what we really care about in the you know the first line might be the the username that's being called with down here. Maybe it's some sort of request ID. There is there's information that's being lost or that we're not capturing at this point. So, you know, even though the line numbers are critical, it's not the most interesting thing. Um, so now we're doing some Scala code, and we're using four comprehensions and doing some futures because they're awesome. And you know we can kind of you know flat map over these things. Um, the problem with you know things like future and other things like you know free monads and other things, um, something like you know exception is now going to cause a lot more problem the problems. So if you get let's say example in a null point exception in that load function, things like future are going to then lose the stack. So you're going to have a lot less information to deal with when you have these exceptions throwing th you know being thrown from your functions. So I'm going to introduce some FP terminology. Uh, I quite like this terminology, which is partial function. Which, um, you know, the, the you know one definition of this is a function that is not defined for all possible arguments. So that what that kind of means, you know, another loose way of saying this is that a function that throws exceptions, which we do all the time and we're kind of used to. Maybe a slightly more accurate version would be that these are functions that throw exceptions or return null, because of course that null then might cause an exception somewhere else. Um, and so, if you if you kind of take, if you believe or you think that functions should be, you know, something that takes an input and returns an output, um, partial functions aren't really functions then, because of course some of those inputs are going to cause exceptions to be thrown. So I want to play kind of a, a, a little game uh, and see if we can guess which which if, whether this is a partial function or not. So if if someone gives you this foo trait and there's a bar function and someone says like, you know, is this bar function partial or not? You know, you look at it maybe, maybe you go and look at the implementation. Um, you know, it, it seems okay, it seems reasonable. But of course, if I actually told you that this function was called option and you were calling the get function, half of you, so m many people in the room might suddenly go, well, actually that's not a good idea because we all know that in fact, get is a partial function because the Scala doc says that if you call it when it's, when it's empty, it's gonna throw an exception. Um, and so another, you know, another example, you know, if I give you the foo function and I say here's a string and an int and it returns a string, is it partial? It, it seems okay, but of course, if we call it substring, suddenly our kind of, uh, you know, how we feel about this function suddenly changes because we, know, of course, we know that if we give it an index that's greater or less than the length, it's gonna, it's gonna suddenly blow up. So I guess when we look at any function, and say is is hello, you know, is hello partial? It calls foo, which can maybe cause bar, which maybe cause something else, which then eventually calls option dot get. Without kind of digging into all the layers of the code, we're never going to know whether a partial is a partial function or not. And we're kind of we're relying on things like our knowledge of option dot get being partial or substring being partial to really know whether something's good or not. But once we start wrapping this in different functions, we suddenly lose the visibility of those the, the partiality of that. So this is something that that. Mark touched on, and I guess I'll be banging on about as well a little bit, which is that if we start to care about these exceptions and what information that they actually carry, so that we're not talking so much about null pointers here, but um, let's say that you know there's a library that exposes this foo function, or maybe a, maybe it's someone on your team in a different you know with a different library, and it's documented that it throws a bad exception, and we care we care about these bad exceptions. We don't want to do we don't want it to raise it to the very top. So we're a good citizen, and we we call foo with a with a try catch, and we we say. You know, if it's a bad exception, do something useful. And then tomorrow, like like Mark did in his talk, you know, we, we're going to add another case of, um, you know, another kind of exception here. We put it in the documentation, but of course, our code keeps recompiling, so there's no way of knowing tomorrow whether the code is going to keep working or not. And this is something we should be able to do. Yeah. 
So just kind of as a, a summary of the partial functions, you know, it would be nice if we could we could turn to type signatures to tell us more about what's going on rather than relying on having to read ScalaDoc or having to read the source code. Um, as we saw, it's not future proof. So if we add different types of exceptions, if the exception, you know, you know, being thrown from a function change in the future, there's no guarantee that our code is going to know about that. And as we saw in the beginning, if you're using things like free monad or, or, or um, future, sorry, um, stack traces suddenly become a lot less useful. So those null pointers become kind of deadly. So I kind of want to get to the world where I can go to the beach with my nail polish and um, you know relax, and I have to worry about if if someone if we upgrade a library suddenly everything's going to break. But the, the, you know we're not just relying on the test that the types are going to tell us something useful. So I kind of want to imagine a world where some of the things I've just mentioned that are bad we should be able to solve in some way using using types and using parts of the Scala. So I'm hoping some people have seen this, but if they haven't, I'm introducing a new data type called either, which is in the the prelude the um the predef. Um, and so it's got it's a sealed trait, and it has two two kind of type uh, two two constructors, um, which it both extends either. So it can either be left or right. Left is traditionally the kind of the error state, and right is the, the value that you actually care about. You'll see how this is used in a second. So let's let's start using either. Just like we're just talking about the actual type signatures of these functions, and we're going to use login and load here, it, kind of in repeated examples. So we're going to do the naive thing for a second, and we'll just say, well, either has an exception on the left-hand side, so it can either return an exception or it can return the session that we care about. But of course, that exception actually there are specific types of exceptions that we're actually going to return. So in this case, we might want to return invalid credentials, and for load, we might want to return that the user's not found. So exception is not necessarily helping us very much. But the nice thing is, you know, when we write this code in, in for comprehension, the for comprehension works on the on the either here. This all works quite nicely. Um, and so if login um, if login returns an, an exception on the left hand side, it stops. If load returns an exception on the left, it stops, and so on and so forth. Just kind of like exceptions will stop the the program running. Um, but the problem, well, you know, I guess as I was talking about it, in, in a sense, when we look at this this type signature of run, and we have, you know, we know that this returns exception, that's great. But when we kind of pattern match this left hand side, we say, okay, I've got an exception. What am I going to do with it? Um, do we print the stack trace? Like that's not going to necessarily be very useful. Um, we can go and looking through the code to see what types of exceptions we might care about, but that won't be future proof. So you know, we're kind of losing information here that we want to get back. So Scala, one of the great things about Scala is it makes Creating data types very cheap. We kind of saw that in Mark's talk. Um, so this is kind of what we had before, where you know some, there's some exception somewhere that's extending exception, and I'm going to return. You know, I'm going to document that I'm going to return it. Um, but let's actually return that data type and, and actually you know put that in the type signature. So this is subtly different. So I'm going to create a sealed trait called login error, and it's going to have one possible instantiation, one constructor called um, invalid credentials, and you're going to put the login error, which is the sealed trait, the type, not the not the constructor there. And so already that, t that type is telling us a lot more information than just having exception. We know that this is going to be a login error, and we, we know that there's only one possible type of login error, which is the invalid credentials. Um, and, and again, for the, for the load function, we're going to have this user not found exception. So we're going to turn that into a, just, a, just a data type, and we're going to extend this. this we're going to make it a type of user error, and there's going to be a user not found type. And so together, looking at this now, this is much, much better than before than having the sort of the Scala doc telling us what we might be able to catch. We now have these types in, you know, we can see what the error types are and we can go and look at them and um, we can extend them with more types if we need to. So this is where you hit the problem, or at least this is, you know, this is the first thing you might hit if you try doing this. So we go back to this code and we try to use this for comprehension with the either. This unfortunately won't compile because you know, we have two different types of errors, or you know, two, two, two different data types, login error and a user error, and they don't share any common data type. There's no, yeah, there's no common data type. So, you, you know, this is where you get tempted to just, just, you know, extend exception, and then we'll, you know, Scala might find this is the common data type, and then you've got exception in the type. So again, we're, we're kind of back to this point already, which is that now the, 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 the type signature run is completely useless, because we don't know that it's actually only going to be the user error and the login error. We've lost this information already. So. Um, while this is tempting, it's not, it's not a good idea. So, you know, data types are cheap. Let's create some more data types. So let's actually create a different data type called app error. Apologies for the, the name, but it's got two type constructors, two data constructors, sorry. So it's got this login error that's literally just wrapping the login error type, and it's got this app, this app um, user error which wraps the user error type. And it's a sealed trait, so it can only possibly be these two possible values. 
So, so again, we're kind of winning here. So now we can, if we look at the type signature of run, there's no Scala doc that we have to read about these Eric types. We can see them in, we can see them here. App error can only be these two things. Login error can only be an auth error, and user error can only be not found. So we know we know all the error cases, cases just by looking at that type signature. Uh, and so this is where um, I, I've sort of I've, I've skipped a step where I should have mentioned that I'm kind of showing you the either type as a as a useful data structure for doing this, but the the specifics of which are not important. Like whether you use either or some other me mechanism, this is not important. The important part is how you expose you know how you expose the errors um, in the type signature. So it would be nice if we could take this call to login and you know lift it up or turn it into this login error and this load function to to take the error up, error type up and turn it into a, an app user error. So you could imagine a world where there's a function, let's call it update error, that the name is not really important, which takes some sort of function callback and turns the L type into an L2 type and then returns the L either of L2. So we can update the error and lift it and wrap it in an app login error and the, and the same with load. And the implementation is not even that interesting particularly. It pattern matches on itself and then if it's left it maps over it, otherwise if it's right it just returns itself again. So now, you know, now when we call, this is for the interesting bit, I guess, is now when we call run um, and looking at the type signature, we, ha you know, we should and can pattern match on, on the result. So we know it could, if it's left, we have to do something. We can pattern match on the error type itself. And we know by, from the types that there are only two possible combinations here. We know that it can possibly be a invalid credentials or it could be a, a user not found. There's no other possible, you know, any other kind of, you can't go and extend app error with something else without this not compiling. So you know, now the question is, what do we want to do with these error types? So now that we know exactly what it can be, we can start writing these functions that says, well, give me, given an app error, I can turn it into a string if you want to. So maybe print this to the console, maybe turn and return it to a web page. If you're using web stuff, maybe you want to turn different status codes. So given an app error, given these different types of errors, we can then return 403s or 404s or, or whatever. It doesn't matter. And so, you know, the examples of which are not particularly interesting, but yes, error messages, logging, status codes. If you're doing command line apps, um, like we do sometimes, returning different exit codes. Maybe you want to serialize the data over the wire to kind of, to kind of report to, the, to a different system what's going on. And this is also, using sealed traits and using this approach also buys us another thing, which is that it's future-proof. So you might be able to see where this is going. So we already have, we have this app error, and we was, it's a sealed trait with two, two constructors. And we've got some code here that's pattern match on and printing or something. Let's say now tomorrow that, that someone else in your team goes and adds this extra error type, and it adds a, a foo error. The, the, the type doesn't matter. As we saw in, in Mark's talk, you know, with, with pattern matching, this, this should give us an error. Now, unfortunately, we also saw that by default, Scala doesn't do the right thing, which is, yeah, sure, you get a warning in the console, but don't worry about it. You know what you're doing. So as, as Mark did as well, I highly recommend turning on things like fatal warnings to make sure that things that should be errors are actually errors rather than just things you can ignore. So now we get this code. Someone's added an app error over here, and suddenly code that's actually pattern matching on these things will now suddenly, will now suddenly fail. So it does mean not using the underscore. It does mean like pattern matching on all the different constructor types. So that's great. So now we kind of don't have to worry about people adding new errors in, you know, tomorrow. And so while this is not technically you know, something that you, you only get from this approach, something that it gets kind of easy when you're doing this all the time and you're using cheap data types is that you can add more context. So we have this app user error, which is one of the two constructor types, and it's got the user error. And apologies for the contrived nature of this, but let's say, for example, that you want to then also stick in, you know, you can also then say, well, I actually want to know what the username was when someone called load. So load doesn't know what the username is, but we actually want to sort of just insert that, insert that just here. So we can kind of say, well, this is useful information. Maybe we need it for logging. Maybe we need it for the, for the JSON. Who knows? Um, and so I kind of sometimes explain or talk about this as like a, a logical stack trace. So you can imagine that we have this app error, which has, you know, one of the constructors is an app user error, which has a user not found. And so you can kind of almost imagine this as kind of this logical stack trace of what's going on, rather than the kind of the spring and hibernate stuff that you don't care about. This is the actual things that, that really tell you what's going on. So like, this is probably the most important point that I'm really trying to make, which is that you know, having your errors as data suddenly gives you a whole bunch of benefits and we solve a whole bunch of problems. You know, we get to see the types now become a lot more interesting and become real documentation, but it also forces us to pattern match on them and actually deal with all the different error cases that, that we have, like whether it's a user not found or whether it's an authentication error. And we can, deal, we can return different status codes and all sorts of things like that. Um, you know, and, and as, I, as I showed, like you know, I kind of think of it like a logical stack trace. So you can you can insert more information in there that otherwise you wouldn't know from just the stack trace point. And as we saw, 
if you if you then decide to add, and when you do add more error types, you know, if you're using the right Scala C, um, you know, flags, you'll actually get errors. So you have to you have to stop and think about it. Okay, so you know, at this point, um, you know, that's really the important stuff, which is that as long as you're returning your errors as data, that's that's what you should that's what you should be doing. So the the next part is really just kind of to show you what happens when you kind of go a little bit deeper, um, just to kind of kind of steer you in the right direction or at least give you one idea of how to how to avoid certain kinds of problems or one kind of problem at least. So this is this is the code that we've had previously just using either. Now either is great but I'm, you know you know it's the real world so we're all using futures. So um, you know and you like this approach so you want to stick your either in the future. So you've got a future of either with these two types of you know with this kind of error, the user error and the login error. Um, and that's fine and that will work just fine. But the problem now becomes what happens if you try to do the for comprehension or or any kind of code? You end up with this kind of frustrating, um, you know, kind of manual labor of when you call login, it's returning a future, but now you have to pattern match on the the either to then put the left back in. And if you call load, if that if you wanted to call a function after that, you'd have to do you'd kind of end up with this sort of tree of unwrapping of the lefts every time. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way, but it gets a bit tedious. So one approach, um, just to kind of um, to kind of demonstrate what you could do, um, you could easily just write your own case class, um, you know, like a, your own data type that has one field, which is this future of either, and has two type parameters, this left and the right. So we're just kind of combining these two things manually, and you you kind of implement the things you need. So you'll need flat map and map if you want to use the for comprehension, and we've been using this update error function. So you also want to stick that in there as well. And so now, the code looks almost exactly like it did before. The only difference being that now, instead of just using either, these are now going to be futures as well. So the code looks nice and exactly the same as it did, but we're now in a future. And just as a kind of a teaser of the next kind of level of what you, what you can do is there's something called an either T, which is even more kind of generic version of this. So rather, the problem with the previous you know, the previous solution would be that you'd have to write a future in either version and a task in either version and every combination of either and something you can imagine. So there are, there are ways to make this even more generic. So you can kind of, if, don't worry if you don't understand the syntax, but you've kind of got this extra sort of abstract hole, which is this F. And so ignoring how that all works, you can imagine code that's using either T without having to go and write this sort of manual combinator of future and either you can kind of get the exact same result, but the only difference being that you've declared that it's a future at every point. So that's that's nice if you get to that point. Um, so that's basically it. Uh, you know, I, I guess there are probably the the two main points I want to make, which is part of a part of a big a big takeaway, which is that um, partial if you're in sort of functional programming world where you want to make sure that your programs do what they say they do every time, um, you know, consider that partial functions are not real functions. So don't don't throw exceptions when you can just return data. You know, and that gives you a whole bunch of benefits. So when you start returning your, your errors, then you start to get things like future proofing. You get to have more intelligent, more kind of useful return codes or status codes or, or JSON or, or, or whatever. Um, and the last slide is just that um, I've always, you know, could highly recommend the Functional Programming in Scala book. If you haven't read it and you're interested in Scala or functional programming, this is, this is a great book to read. And in fact, there's a whole chapter on just handling exceptions without, without handling errors without exceptions. And underscore.io and uh, Noel Walsh are doing a whole bunch of really great sort of blog posts and, and training material as well, and they're worth having a look at. And finally, my GitHub re repo has both these slides and also some, some code if you want to just have a quick play with, you know, either T and, and futures of either's and things. And that's it. Thanks. All right. Does uh, anyone have any questions? <laughs> oh. It was all self-explanatory. Cool. Uh, have, have, have you done any experiments with using um, co-products to get rid of that update error um, uh, no. extra this, this bit is, of... This is fine. It works. Okay. You know, code, code compiles and breaks when it should. Yep. You, can, you can, though. That's what I mean. Like, there, there are different ways of doing this, and they're, they're all worth doing as long as you're getting that benefit of code breaks when it should break. and. Um, you're capturing all the errors as data. You choose your choose your mechanism. Just wanted to point out that the either T, the good, real good, uh, real world use case for that is yep. if you have code that's non-blocking, but if you want to test it in a unit test, then an either T of unit is great um, because uh, it creates a, 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 a synchronous sequential run. You don't have to worry about all the execution contexts. So when you uh, introduce a talk, it's uh, 
no no stack traces in this world where yep. everything's out there now. Um, futures fine.